episode 36 of the rain race podcast here today uh live once again monday same time uh and as always you can ask your questions in the comments during these uh during this entire podcast if you'd like us to answer them and uh, i'm not here alone as always i'm joined by kyle cuthbertson aka racing nation tv what's up guys we actually don't have any races to recap today so it's gonna be a strictly news related podcast um, and I'm a little bit sleep deprived because of the Super Bowl and just waking up early for classes, but hopefully some smooth sailing still. Uh, one thing I do want to address is that for no apparent reason outside of the YouTube algorithm being very unpredictable, uh, my YouTube channel has exploded in the last week. Um, I know two weeks ago when we rebooted this podcast, uh, I had like 900 subscribers maybe and then last week it was maybe 1100 or something and uh, this week i'm at like 2300 right now so if we get quite a few new people here uh welcome first of all this is the rain race podcast it's a podcast i started back in 2018 with kyle here and uh, we just switched them over to live shows in the past year or so just opens it up for some more uh you know discussion with people in the chat and uh, i just think it makes for an overall better experience but you can check out the podcast tomorrow night on podcasting platforms everywhere. That's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, iHeart, wherever you want to listen to it should be there. If it's not, just let me know and I'll make sure it ends up there in the future. So anyways, like I said, strictly news related episode today. And uh, obviously the focus of this episode by the thumbnail and the title, we're going to be talking about Remen Grosjean and his switch from Haas Formula One to IndyCar. Confirmed now. We talked about this in the last episode. Uh, driving for Dale Coin Racing with Rick Ware. Uh, Kyle, any initial thoughts on this announcement? Yeah, the uh, I think the big key to this news is that he's running the 13 road and street course races, uh, not running the ovals. Um, the interesting, we pretty much already knew that this deal was basically confirmed after Kevin Lee kind of broke it during the Rolex. It's been in the rumor mill for months, but uh, I, th I think one of the big things is before his uh, crash at Bahrain last year, uh, he was actually going to be doing the full season. And we still thought that there was a possibility that he would be doing the full season, but now uh, he will be running the 13 road and street course races, but he has kind of also hinted that he wouldn't, uh, he, he'd think about doing the, the short oval gateway race. So, you know, I love to, I, I can't wait to see how he performs. Uh, the IndyCar series is definitely, uh, growing, uh, to be this sort of all-star series with all these, uh, big names coming from different forms of motorsport, NASCAR, V supercars, and now, uh, now for, uh, Formula One. I've already had a, it's interesting how IndyCar since, Rossi and Chilton came over and all those guys uh, that the, uh, the the amount of ex Formula One drivers in IndyCar has kind of grown a lot. And uh, uh, some of them have been, you know, spectacular and some of them have been, uh, you know, just uh, kind of OK, you know, so uh, we'll have to wait and see how Romain does. But I, uh, I, I think he'll do good. So he is kicking off the uh, his IndyCar running, I guess. Uh, at the season opener um, at St. Petersburg, but... Well, he does have a test at Barber. Yes, I was just going to mention that. He has a test at Barber Motorsports Park on the 22nd of February, so that's, uh, looking at my calendar, that's going to be two weeks from today, actually. So, depending on how much news is actually available from that event, two weeks from now, we may be able to get you a little bit of a recap on that test. Um, obviously, expect... Is that going to be an IndyCar open test, or is that just going to be a closed Dale Coin test? Uh, I do know that Ed Jones will be there with him, but I'm not 100%. Okay, so I'm just trying to think of like how. I open do know to, like, that, timing that uh, like, exclusive Autosport and a couple of other Road to Indy teams were at Barber today, and uh, they do have some other tests kind of scheduled for later in the month. So it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, say, like uh, a Ganassi shows up with them. Or maybe this test is just exclusively in uh, that they want to get Grosjean on the track and get his hand hand to kind of heal 
and they might have brought in some other road to indie teams to kind of get them some more track time, you know, because, you know, running out, getting, you know, the track to yourself without bringing other teams along uh, is kind of, you know, you don't really see it that often. That's kind of rare. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, more IndyCar teams joined along. I wouldn't be surprised to see like a Jimmy Johnson come and test, but he has tests a lot. And there's a, there, there are testing rules in IndyCar still, I believe. So uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me, but I do know the only thing I know for a fact is that Jones will be there. Just reading the chat real quickly. Uh, good evening, Taurus. Thanks for coming along. Uh, Stone said seeing Jimmy Johnson versus Grosjean is going to be insane. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting because you're going to have two drivers, uh, both racing, I don't want to say exclusively because we're still kind of in the air with Grosjean about you know tracks like Gateway. Um, but it, it, let's say exclusively road course races, uh, and they're both coming from two completely different disciplines. So actually kind of an interesting matchup to see who has the uh, upper hand. I mean, I know you're kind of comparing Chip Ganassi racing to uh, Dale Coyne, but Dale Coyne has also shown some great uh, potential in past seasons, so you'll never know. Uh, Benass1, I just discovered your channel. Hello. Hello back. Thanks for stopping by to this podcast. Um, Back to the Grosjean thing here. Uh, I mean, me personally, I think that it's a great deal for IndyCar. Obviously, we brought this up in the last episode where IndyCar, they have all the ingredients that they need to get a huge international interest going, you know, with these ex Formula One drivers coming in, uh, especially someone like Grosjean, who was a full time Formula One driver for the past decade. Um, certainly a great name to have coming over to IndyCar. I think it'll draw a lot of attention. But the problem is they have all the ingredients except for uh, a consistently decent TV deal across the board, especially in like Europe and South America. Mm -hmm. So. That's sort of uh, what we were talking about last week with the downfall of, or not the downfall, but that's sort of their downside right now is you have all this attention, but some countries don't even have a legal way of accessing it, or at least one that's easy. I uh, hope this will at least open things up for France to want, to, for more people. I don't know what their deal is right now, but I know when, um, I don't, you know, the international deal, I don't know the specifics of each country. But I do know when Ericsson and Rosenquist uh, both came in in 18, they definitely, I believe, got a better deal because there's a lot of, there's a lot more. Obviously, having two Swedish drivers brings in a lot more Swedish fans. So I do believe they got a sweeter deal uh, out of those drivers coming in. Right. Uh, will asked, do you think Rosen will be okay to race with the whole incident recovery going on? Um, I mean, I don't know anything more than he does about his personal medical condition, but I'm sure he wouldn't be uh, putting himself in the position if he knew he wasn't going to be able to put himself up to the test. Um, yeah, the February, the February uh, 18th test, I, this is the data I saw, uh, will definitely be the test for that. What I think is going to shock him uh, when he first drives this car is the lack of power steering, and on top of that, I would probably the lack of downforce as well compared to a formula one car so the, there's he's got a lot you know of changes to fight here as well as you know kind of coming back from an, an injury for the first you know you see how that goes it's gonna does, be interesting does he have a test on the 18th because yeah. the, the date i, I saw is the, the date, 22nd i trust my sources okay and you're that's the one that you were mentioning was that barber yeah okay that's just weird because i'm like the official word I see out, at least I'll take autosport.com saying uh, February 22nd. So we'll see. Um, maybe some secret test I haven't heard about, but McCall They try to keep these things kind of on the down low. Yeah, I mean, that makes but sense. It, it usually goes out, though, because it's also not hard to figure out, but they don't put it out there. Macaulay said, uh, I always thought Romain would go to Lama, especially with Peugeot. Coming back, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people had their eyes on that. A lot of people, and we're going to talk about uh, Peugeot's driver lineup later on here. Um, but I think that that was a pretty common thought that a lot of people had. A lot of people are like, okay, you have a French driver. Peugeot's naturally going to want French drivers. Um, you know, Roman's looking for a job. 
Um, so I think that that kind of fit in there, but doesn't look like that's the case. This will be my first season watching IndyCar. I've watched a lot of highlights from last season. Um, yeah, I mean, just judging off what you're saying, it looks like you're coming from the F1 side of things, and that's what I mean. It's great um, for IndyCar to be pulling these fans from, from F1 over the past few years. I mean, if you go back to, like, the IRL days, I'm talking, like, 2004, 2005. Um, I mean, you can even look earlier than that if you if you want it to be even more exaggerated, but... Imagine saying that we'd be back pulling in like former F1 drivers to IndyCar. I think that that would be just like a huge name or there'd just be a huge news story, but it's becoming more of a common thing in recent years with Rossi, Erickson, Chilton, and now Grosjean. Uh, there's a couple more questions that I'm going to get to later on. See, this is one thing is I'm not used to having the chat rolling this quickly, so... We'll try to get to some of these things later on. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I have on the Grosjean story right now. Uh, as I mentioned, this is going to be a joint effort with um, uh, Rick Ware Racing, like we predicted in the last episode. So we'll have to see how he gets on it. Which of course... there's, there's still an oval car to fill. Plus, they have yeah. the Rick Ware team, I believe, will be putting. Uh, they, were all, they will also be... Uh, in a conjoined effort with Dale Coyne to produce a second car for them, the 52 car. Which the 51 car, it, it was weird how they announced this or how, how it's been talked about because obviously uh, Rick Ware's son and full-time NASCAR Cup Series driver now, uh, Cody Ware, also competing in the Rolex 24, he tested uh, the car at Sebring a couple weeks ago and ended up only like a tenth off Jimmy Johnson in his first ever test in IndyCar. Uh, I think... I believe the way they kind of said it is, I think they're looking for a driver, but if they can't find another driver, then Cody's just kind of like waiting in the wings. It's gonna be interesting though because I haven't, I didn't exactly look, but I, I should at what races. Like if he was to be the oval driver, you know, are there any oval races that kind of clash with the the uh, NASCAR Cup Series schedule? If he's gonna be a full time Cup Series driver, and the other discussion was. If he does the Indy 500 in the in the third in in that car, then he would be totally in line to do the double, the uh, Coke 600 NASCAR race and the Indy 500. Uh, and he he flat out said that he need the he'd need a plane to get there because he wouldn't be able to do a commercial because he's you know he doesn't have a Cessna jet lined up like the other drivers. You know he'd have to work and get that done first. Uh, so uh, a lot of you know interesting things with that second car, and if it's I've heard it's not James Davison. I've heard James Davison, like, his name go out a lot. I've heard he's probably not going to be doing any any IndyCar racing this year. So, um, in the 52 car as well, Rick Ware uh, and Dale Coyne said that car could contest up to, you know, four or five other races uh, than the 8500. So, uh, th as far as drivers go, I'm, I mean, we discussed drivers uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I can't really I mean Zach Veach. Maybe Gabby Chavez, uh, Jaron just said Carlos Munoz, you know, maybe for the ovals. Well, I mean, it's just, it's <laughs> anybody's guess. Yeah, I mean, you're just jumping back to what we were talking about last week, which after 20 minutes of discussion, I think I came to the conclusion that I don't know. And I know that you mm -hmm. don't know either. So, um, yeah, Jaron also said, did you see... Do uh, I think he's trying to say, do you see Magnuson trying out an IndyCar? I briefly discussed this last week. Um, I think it's, you know, it's definitely possible with his position right now at Ganassi driving their uh, DPI program. Um, and if that's something that he's interested in, I certainly think that Chip would allow a test for him. Uh, we'll just have to see what the future of, uh, of Chip's sports car racing program looks like if he tries to hold on to Magnuson. Um, you know, if that somehow comes to an end with the new regulations, which I don't believe it would, but we'll have to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, short answer, I do think that you could see Magnuson at least, at the very least, getting a test in an Indy car because, I mean, he certainly has the potential to be a great driver and I don't see any reason why Chip would turn it down. Um, as for other teams, I'm not really too sure. I think Chip would be the most probable team right now, uh, just naturally. And 
He also said, I think Cody Ware will take the ovals. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, the only question is, like you brought up, Kyle, the whole ovals conflicting with the NASCAR season with uh, Cody running full-time in Cup. I think we're going to move it on uh, here to the uh, Peugeot LMH driver announcement. Um, so this morning, the uh, French manufacturer came out and announced all six of their full-time drivers for the 2022 World Endurance Championship season. That's Paul DeResta, Kevin Magnussen, hey, we just said that name, Jean-Eric Verne, Luke Duval, Mikhail Jensen, and Gustavo Menezes. Um, they didn't specify who's in which car yet. Um, what it does tell us is that they're running two cars full-time. I think that that was pretty much expected. Uh, and they also named James Rossiter as their simulator and reserve driver. So a little bit interesting, I think. Somewhat noteworthy that this program is at least a year away. I'd say at the minimum it's 13 months away from getting on track, and they're already announcing a driver lineup, uh, which I found a little bit interesting. But, uh, I mean, certainly, if this tells us anything, it tells us that they're coming out strong. I mean, they're not playing around. That's a pretty stacked driver lineup. Um, I mean, I looked down the list here. Kevin Magnussen, obviously Formula One, Loke Duvall, uh, multiple-time winner in LMP1 for Audi. Uh, Gustavo Menezes also raced for Rebellion in LMP1. I mean, you're looking down a list there of LMP2 drivers and people who have just all around a lot of experience driving uh, Le Mans prototype based cars, uh, which the hypercar class is, you know, as different as it is from LMP cars, you know, LMP1 hybrids, it's still, as I noted in my Toyota video, I mean, it looks like these cars are derived from LMP based cars. Uh, I mean, do you have anything to note on this driver announcement? Uh, not, not really. I think it's a great driver lineup. And uh, not only is the manufacturer battle and hypercar going to be pretty great, the the, uh, the battle of the drivers, are, you know, there's a lot of talent in hypercar, which is nice to see. Yeah, I mean, I think the most noteworthy thing is what I already said, that it seems ultra early to be announcing a full-time driver lineup. But the only other question that I have with this um, is Kevin Magnuson. I mean, right now he's racing with Chip Ganassi in their DPI program, like I just said a few minutes ago. Um, now, I would assume that this means that he would be out of that role. If anything, it looks like he's using that uh, full season drive as a place to get experience uh, for the full time factory Peugeot drive. Um, you know, one of my friends who sort of has an in with Ganassi said otherwise earlier, but I'm not too sure about that. Uh, we'll have to see if, uh, if Magnuson ends up doing both. I can't see a world where it makes a lot of sense though, especially when you have races like, um, the super Sebring, which hopefully that thing actually gets back up and running. Uh, because hopefully. yeah, it's been two years now where it hasn't been able to occur because of the pandemic, unfortunately. But when you have races like that, I can't see, especially when you're dealing with a factory program, you know, where these guys are more strict on what they let their drivers do, especially when they're, uh, you know, full-time contracted driver. So if I had to guess right now, I'd guess that Magnuson's just using the Ganassi drive for experience um, and that he will not be doing IMSA full-time next year. He may end up doing like the Daytona 24 for Ganassi still. Um, that's my only other thing to note here, really. Um, oh yeah, also another thing um, I forgot to mention is that Loic Duvall drove the uh, Peugeot 908 back in the day. Uh, I believe it was for the uh, Orica team. Yes, it was for the Orica team. Um, and yeah, I don't think that there's anything else really to say on that note. Uh, so we'll move on to Ferrari next. A uh, quick note here about Ferrari because there's not really too much to say about it other than a quick I told you so because uh, Ferrari uh, pretty much suggested to uh, Speed Week this past week, which is a, a Red Bull-owned publication, that they will not be making an engine for IndyCar uh, anytime soon at least. Um, contrary to good friend David Land, who has been trying to say the otherwise recently, uh, 
I think that this is sort of what I expected. I don't know about you, Kyle, but I never really saw Ferrari ending up in IndyCar. I mean, there are too many things that didn't make sense for me. Number one, IndyCar is already switching over to new engine regulations in like 2023, right? So you're telling mm -hmm. me that they're going to be, you know, looking at an engine for maybe 2022. Maybe they were looking at 2023, but I know some of the reports I saw suggested even earlier. Um, it just didn't make sense to me. Uh, the whole backstory of this, obviously, was Ferrari, um, due to Italian law, which I'm not too familiar with, and I don't want to get into it for that reason, uh, required Ferrari to pretty much offhand a lot of their staff because, um, well, okay, so with the F1 budget restrictions for 2022, Ferrari were going to have to move their staff elsewhere, but because of Italian law, they wouldn't be able to just fire all of them. Um, so they would have had to put them somewhere pretty much. So it was pretty much an IndyCar engine or like an, uh, maybe even a factory IndyCar team that was noted. Um, I know LMDH got brought up, Lamar Hypercar got brought up. Ultimately, looks like that staff is going to the Haas F1 team, which is a Ferrari-affiliated Formula 1 team for all intents and purposes. Uh, and as a result, no IndyCar and uh, still a question mark on LMDH uh, or LMH right now. So, I mean, Kyle, obviously, kind of a blow for IndyCar. They've been looking for that third manufacturer ever since they got the second one, which was Chevy. Um, does this come at all as a surprise to you, though? Not really. <laughs> I honestly... Um, it, hmm. They've been working on this third manufacturer for so long. It's kind of turned into a joke honestly um it's honestly more of a meme of when when the heck is indycar gonna get that third ma engine manufacturer they've been talking about all these years um and uh is it ever gonna happen who who knows honestly um i on i if for i mean ferrari need i think needs to do the 500 someday there's too much of a history behind it um, I just, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish someday, uh, that it does happen. They it would just be so cool. Ferrari coming to the Indy 500 would just be one of the coolest things to happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just, IndyCar needs that third engine manufacturer. Cause you know, honestly, what happens, uh, when the day comes that either Honda pulls out or Chevy pulls out or, uh, you know, both. What happens? You know, when they only have two uh, in the series, what happens? You know, it's just, yeah. And this whole, you know, bringing in spec hybrids and all I, to bring in manufacturers. Did that work? <laughs> Has it worked? We're going to have spec hybrids with the same manufacturers that we had before that. That's just how it is. It's just, it sucks. It really it sucks. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, they had the very brief Porsche rumors back in 2019 or 2018. Which Porsche backed out because IndyCar didn't have hybrids, and IndyCar brought in hybrids to bring in manufacturers, and still nobody has uh, no, nobody has, uh, taken that up. You know what's a shame, though, is I think Cosworth has said multiple times that they're interested in getting back in, but they just don't have the money for it. And because of... I think the main reason they don't have the money for it, correct me if I'm wrong, but... IndyCar has the whole OEM deal right now where, like, if you're an engine supplier, you also need to do sponsorship for the races. and Which doesn't surprise me. I don't know the exact rule on that, but that would not surprise me. That just sounds like the, the typical thing that probably would have been brought, like, to rule under the in the Holman era that just is still a thing. And Cosworth, it would not surprise me if Cosworth is, like, banging on the door. Uh, to become an engine manufacturer, and IndyCar is just like, no. Because, I mean, HPD, Honda HPD, uh, Chevy is an Elmore, which are, you know, obviously they're owned by the brand, but they have to, you know, they can't. You're not going to have a bunch of Elmore IndyCars out there. You're going to have Chevy IndyCars, you you know. And uh, they have a Cosworth. I guess IndyCar doesn't want that. It's weird. I don't agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody said there were Lambo rumors too. Um, 
I can't remember if there were Lamborghini rumors for IndyCar. I remember they had um like GTE rumors for Lamborghini, but I don't remember anything from IndyCar. Um, Here's the other problem. You have this big boom going on in IndyCar right now, if you haven't noticed, for Indy 500 entries. Mm -hmm. You have all of these team interests, okay? You have a lot of team interests and a huge lack of manufacturer interest. So when every team is leasing engines and Chevy and Honda are both complaining that they're right at their limit and producing, I believe it's like 17, 16 each engines for the month of May. Um, if you want to grow beyond having 37 entries for bump day, then you need another manufacturer. Okay, and you have all these teams. That, how many times coming into uh, coming into talking about Indy 500 entries, have you heard a team have interest in running the race, but the number one hangup to enter the race is an engine lease. It's because all the engine leases are usually all taken up, and it's just we need that third engine manufacturer. It's just for the growth of the series. If you, because right now you have a, the ceiling is too low for the amount of team interest. You need to raise that ceiling. You need to get somebody in here, which is why when something like Porsche wants to come to IndyCar, but when they want to like produce their own hybrid, when you want, you know, when they want to do something different that you don't agree with and you just, you know, <laughs> you just tell them to leave. Yeah. You're really shooting yourself in the foot and it's just, it's annoying. It's, it's yeah, it sucks. <laughs> you know what that reminds me of though? It reminds me of the issue that sports car racing, like top level prototype racing is also in at the moment where Toyota was pretty much saying, yeah, we'll stay if we can make our own hybrid system. Um, and they're pretty much the only manufacturer who has stuck with the World Endurance Championship in LMP1 since 2012. So it's kind of difficult to tell all these other teams, yeah, we'll do off-the-shelf hybrid systems like IMSA's doing uh, to save costs, because then Toyota's like, okay, well, then I'm out. And it's hard. You know, the connection I'm making with this to IndyCar is that, let's say IndyCar did say, okay, we'll let you make your own hybrid system, but then... Porsche, not Porsche, then Honda and Chevrolet are both like, okay, well, we didn't want to do this. We're out now. You know, you get Porsche, but then you could have lost two manufacturers. That's sort of the the uh, two-way swing that I see that's happening across multiple series right now. And it's just really a problem because all of these different car manufacturers obviously have different intentions. I think the main thing we've seen recently is that manufacturers want to go electric or you know hybrid racing, but they don't want to spend a lot of money for it. The only ones who I've seen who have consistently kept that same sort of mantra would be Toyota because they've been, like I said, they've been doing the LMP1 hybrid and now they're doing the Le Mans hypercar hybrid for the past eight years now, nine years. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's a two-way swing, and it's really hard for one side to convince manufacturers when you're going to potentially draw away some of the others. Um, I saw a comment a little bit uh, further up. I just want to find that again real quick. Um, it was about Callum Eilat. Here it is from Jason. Uh, Ferrari said Callum Eilat uh, is going to do a GT program. Does that mean the World Endurance Championship or DTM? Um, well, I don't know really, to be honest. I don't know like definitively, uh, but I did just read up on that and Ferrari said that they want him to do some of their biggest uh, sports car races. And that leads me to believe that he could be like a third driver at Le Mans, similar to the role that Antonio Giovinazzi was in for AF Corsa at Le Mans. Um, just as sort of an aside there, but I did want to get to it because uh, it did seem like a pretty good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else to go on with IndyCar here, except for that their next set of engine regulations are going to be a huge deal because IndyCar, you know, when they set themselves up with something, they're just like any other thing, really. They're stuck with those regulations for a while. And it's, I think, harder to attract manufacturers to IndyCar than it is sports car racing at the moment, just because of how road-relevant you can make sports car racing. 
uh, and just the variety you get from sports car racing as well. You know, if you want to spend less money and have a car that's pretty heavily road car derived, you can just go GT3 racing. And that's why we see IMSA doing GTD Pro and getting rid of GTE. And if you want to work more on technology that you're going to put into the road cars, you can go make a hypercar or you can go race top class IMSA prototypes with LMDH or DPI right now. The problem I think with IndyCar is they don't really have that upper hand when it comes to attracting manufacturers. You know, they're pretty set in stone on this um, on this whole spec uh, aero package, which I think that that was also a thing that drew Ferrari away, if I'm not mistaken. Did Ferrari say they would like want to make their own chassis? I believe so. Which, or at least again, aero. It, again, it's one of those things that IndyCar just like, has their head like set on is only having one chassis manufacturer and when you have someone like ferrari say hey we want to make a chassis we're interested in making a chassis and guess what you did indycar you have this deal with delara to be the uh sole supplier of your chassis because they were willing to build a, a building and speedway so you Guess what you did? You, you sold those rights away, and now Ferrari, who is interested in building another chassis for your series, I don't, I, th I don't think they want. They definitely didn't want to be the sole supplier. They wanted to compete against Delara and build a chassis, which would have been very cool, well, really good for the series. But it's not happening. Right. Of course, the other side of that. You know, the pessimistic side is, okay, well, that would have drawn up R&D costs for Delara, which in turn is R&D costs for the teams, and that could have been a, a downward spiral. Which, you know, this is where you have to decide if you want to be conservative when it comes to coming up with policies for your next set of regulations, because it definitely seems like IndyCar is one of the most conservatives of the lot when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, you know, you look at They've been pretty set to this uh, spec arrow thing ever since the arrow kits died. And the arrow kits died mainly because this cost started getting a little bit out of control and it was driving the small teams out. Um, but even the arrow kits, they didn't step as far as like they originally intended them to. Mm -hmm. I mean, they yeah. sort of limited the manufacturers once they actually got on board with it to how many changes they could make in a year uh, and how many different packages that, packages they could run in a year. So... IndyCar right now, obviously, they have an eye primarily on costs, which I think that that's why they're turning down the opportunity to have new chassis manufacturers. And in turn, that's unfortunately turning away some of these teams and some of these manufacturers who have been interested in engine um, or in supplying an engine for IndyCar. Um, I don't know. It's just a shame all around. Like I said earlier, it's a two-way swing, really. You know, do you want to take a risk here, take a gamble and try to attract a new manufacturer. Or do you want to hold on to the ones that you have right now? I'm looking back. I saw in the chat that actually is a thing that I want to point out. Um, someone earlier suggest, like said something about multi-class open wheel racing because of hybrid systems. Um, and then the fastest 33 didn't like that. Um, but Taurus actually said, I think Indy Lights was multi-class in the late 90s. So here's what's fun. Uh, I don't, Indy Lights today isn't multi-class. Uh, I do, it was in the 90s, I believe. They had the, like, pro drivers and, and then I believe Am. But fun fact, uh, the Indy Pro 2000 class and the Road to Indy is still, they still have, like, a older, older class. <laughs> they still have, like, an old class and a, like a pro am thing going on. It's actually really interesting. I just wanted to point that out. That's actually the first I heard of that. So how does that work, real quick? Just because I haven't heard of this, and I'm yeah. sure some pro other drivers. And you have you know older guys who want to go out there and have fun. But how do they actually score that differently? Like, uh, is there some sort of champion who's? Do they have like a champion in each class? Or because I, I don't know. think it's as like prevalent as it, so. A couple of years ago. I did actually see it on a timing sheet. Uh, I don't, it's not like, it's a thing. It is a thing. Because you have the, the Charles, you have Charles Finelli with Fatboy Racing. You have 
um, Kaminsky, you know, those, they show up and they race. And a few years ago, I like specifically a few years ago, I remember there was a, a, uh, two different classes in that series. It's, it's a thing. And it's been a thing in the road to Indy like for years in the early and late, like late mid nineties throughout the nineties, Indy lights, when it was in its young age, uh, they had, you know, pro and am drivers. Cause if you go look at like Indy lights fields, uh, back then they were huge, absolutely huge because there was different, like there were different, uh, like classes. There's two, I believe. I don't know all of it, but I know that's a thing and it's very interesting. The road to Indy is very underrated, very cool, and very interesting. It deserves more coverage and it deserves more attention because it is, it's actually amazing. Back to the Ferrari IndyCar thing for my last point here. Um, now, Mattia Panotto did say that uh, Ferrari could consider um, a powertrain package in IndyCar when they go to their new hybrid formula. Take that as you will. I mean, this is how many times has Ferrari said they're interested and how many times have they then shot it down? Um, this is why I'm infinitely skeptical when it comes to any manufacturers saying that they're interested in IndyCar at this point. Um, somebody mentioned earlier in the chat, and it's definitely true that Ferrari has said things like this in the past before for politics and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of to get what they want from Formula One because Ferrari has in the past on numerous occasions threatened to leave Formula One. I just don't see that happening unless the FIA absolutely gives them what they don't want. Um, but Does I will... Ferrari have like veto power in Formula One still. Uh, I you're, swear you're asking questions above my knowledge right now. Okay. Somebody in the chat might be able to help you, but Ferrari, like I, I heard once that Ferrari like literally has uh, like a veto power. Like they have some sort of rule in the uh, like regulation or something, because the teams do. I, I have to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking before I say something totally out of like totally like not true. But I do. I'm gonna look it up before I well, say the, anything. Well, the teams vote on regulations yeah, in Formula One, but that's what I thought. But I don't think I don't know if any manufacturer has like veto power. I, that doesn't. It's nothing I've ever heard about. Hold on. Keep talking. I'll do stuff. Um. Uh, well, I mean, Drayton says Ferrari does not. Uh. So. But Drayton's also been uh acting extremely mature in the chat, so I don't know. <laughs> Not too sure. Love you, Drayton. Um, See, there it is. Since the 1980s, Ferrari has had veto power in Formula One. If it doesn't like the rule, a rule, the series or its governing body, the FIA wants to implement, the team can step in and stop things. FIA President John Tott, this is from like 2018. FIA President John Tott thinks Ferrari should lose that ability, which brings up the question of why the team has it in the first place. Because mm -hmm. remember... Uh, remember, you know how they give the teams like money for being like an historical team and stuff? Yeah. They've had this since the 80s. Okay. I mean, Stone just said in the chat, uh, Ferrari gets two votes unless I'm mistaken. I don't know. I'm not going to so, continue talking so, about this just because so I have absolutely no knowledge. Basis. I did know something. <laughs> I did yeah. have it there. I, I don't even I remember how we got on talking, the, but... how we got on that note, but... Yeah, I apologize. don't take anything I just said there of a fact because, again, that's completely out of my pay grade. You might have to go ask um, Will Buxton that question. Um, and I think the last thing we're going to talk about very briefly today, this is going to be a pretty short episode, but again, we didn't have any races or events to recap. Um, so a little bit of a shorter episode. Um, but I did want to briefly touch on Lewis Hamilton re-signing with Mercedes in Formula 1. Uh, I hardly have anything to say about this, but he will be contending for his eighth championship title. And uh, I believe it's just still a year-by-year -year deal. So I just believe it's a one-year contract extension. Doesn't really come as a surprise to me, though. So, And I'm sure you're feeling the same about that. I'm sorry, I'm still reading this <laughs> veto thing. Uh, I was talking about Lewis Hamilton. Uh, I... Just just speaking on, on uh, just totally um, reading things and not under like knowing what you just said, I think he retires after after uh, the one year contract's up, and I do mm, think he wins number just... eight and then drops the mic. 
That's a spicy take. You want to elaborate on that? Um, it took him this long to re-sign. I think he was really thinking about it. And uh, yeah, he's gonna he's gonna do this season, probably win his eighth title, and then drop the mic. Mm-hmm. And Ferrari is gonna be like tenth fastest with their veto power, so it really doesn't do him much good. Which, by the way, they they I'm researching this further. They have veto power. Right. All right. Well, I think that that's gonna be enough to, uh, to wrap this episode up. Um. Again, appreciate everybody who tuned into this episode uh, and everybody who asked questions as well. That's a greatly encouraged. Actually, I really want to get this one thing because we had one more point from Akali here. Uh, One-year deal for Hamilton. So Russell, Botas, Ocon contracts all out of contract. I think he's trying to say Russell, Botas, and Ocon are all out of a contract at the end of the year. Um yeah, we'll have to see. I mean, I think right now people are predicting that Russell's going to end up at Mercedes. He did that really well. Or he did that really fantastic drive at uh, Sakir, the Bahrain outer circuit, until the uh, tire issue. And Botas, I don't really see any reason to suggest he'd, suggest he'd be leaving Mercedes quite yet. But uh, who knows? We're going to have to discuss that later on in the year. Anyway, like I was saying, I'm going to wrap it up for this episode of the Rain Race Podcast. Appreciate everybody who tuned in and everybody who asked questions. Um, A lot more fun when we have people who are actively in the chat and able to correct us on our mistakes and uh, ask some questions. Like I said at the beginning, you can check out this episode tomorrow um, on podcasting platforms everywhere. And uh, we'll be back next week, Monday, same time, 9 p.m. Eastern, for another episode of the Rain Race Podcast. And we hope to catch you all there.